your presentation about our marvelous farmer. April 13th, a special day. And we are continuing the celebration from, as Bill said this morning, the Washington DC Jefferson Memorial was spectacular with our society being there. And Thomas Jefferson was born 279 years ago. And we celebrate his love of country, his love of life, his brilliance, and especially today, his love of farming. And we know he had many important titles, but we can add, of course, farmer, gourmet, scientist, traveler, and diplomat. And one of our members actually has Thomas Jefferson as a supplemental. And so Davina, she is here. The National Society Descendants of American Farmers officially honors President Thomas Jefferson as an American farmer. And Davina, our member is here. That wonderful, has wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So glad you submitted his name. It's really spectacular. And Jefferson's farm was located on a mountaintop in Albemarle County in the Royal Virginia country. Jefferson. He owned 10,647 acres. I'm going to ask everyone to please mute. Would you all please mute? Thank you. 10,647 acres of farm, plantation, and undeveloped land. And most of the time, he had 34 horses, five mules, 249 head of cattle, 390 hogs, and several sheep. He needed 7,240 pounds of hog meat annually to feed his family, his friends, and his health. And Jefferson reached Monticello January 16th, 1794 to retire. Lucky him. And he loved being home. He loved the pure, fresh air. And he enjoyed the drama of the seasons. And he loved the first blooms of the almond trees and the arrival of bluebirds and the arrival of blackbirds. And these sights and sounds actually expanded his soul. He disassociated from politics. He refused to read newspapers, but Madison, his friend, still sent him three letters a week. So he'd be in touch with the government goings on. His retirement years were doing what he loved, and he truly believed that those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. Work on the farm, of course, was strenuous, but Jefferson was happy doing it. He always was up at sunrise, checking on his farm from early morning until dark, because overseeing was crucial. And it was his chief focus to rehabilitate his land because it had suffered during his government years. So he diligently studied books on the subject of soil. He decided after reading to rotate his crops. And the first year was wheat. The second year, Indian corn. The third year, peas or potatoes. And the fourth year, vetches, which were legumes that were very high in nutritional value. Instituting the rotation of crops restored fertility to his lands. And he watched his costs continually. He kept notebooks. He needed sound business practices and his notebooks were filled with innumerable calculations. He even figured the cost of maintaining a plow horse per acre, which came to two pounds, 13 shillings. And Thomas Jefferson loved innovating farm tools. 
he improved a Scottish threshing machine, which then accounted for 120 to 150 bushels of wheat a day. He even received an award from the French Society of Agriculture for his work on a plow mold board that he thought was mathematically perfect. And he wrote, John Adams, I returned to farming and instead of writing 10 to 12 letters a day, I put off answering these letters now farmer-like till a rainy day. And Jefferson had a huge area on the protected south side of Monticello Mountain and how fortunate he was to have this land. He grew fruits, tomatoes and beans. He grew roots, beets and carrots and leaves, which were the lettuce and cabbage. He even had a 10 foot wooden fence for protection to keep his plants safe from rabbits and deer, but the fence did not work all the time and they got their fair share. His orchards were also on the south side of the mountain and he grew apples, peach trees, and cherry trees. He even experimented with harder to grow pears, plums, almonds, and apricots. And he noted favorites of each fruit and he declared that the carnation cherry was so superior to all the others that it was the only one that deserved the name cherry. Thomas Jefferson was a scientific farmer. He appreciated the food, but it was more of a laboratory for him. And he experimented with 330 varieties of more than 89 species of vegetables. And among his plants also included squash and broccoli that he imported from Italy. Beans that were actually collected by Lewis and Clark. Figs that came from France and peppers from Mexico. And he kept a notebook on the dates the seeds were planted, on the dates the leaves appeared, and the dates the fruits were visible. And he selected one or two of the best varieties and he rejected all the others. And his favorite of all these was the English pea. Jefferson's favorite foods at home were squirrel stew, hoe cakes, sweet potatoes, turnip greens, and Virginia ham. Jefferson actually introduced rice, tomatoes, and soybeans, and he even shared a recipe for tofu. Who would think? When he was minister to the court of Louis XVI of France, it made a huge impression on him, and his tables, both public and private, reflected his love for culinary adventure. And when he was a minister in Paris, he took meticulous notes of the dishes that he liked. So when he was home, he could serve them. And he actually traveled to Holland and he was there, he had his very first waffles. And the first thing he did was buy a waffle iron. In Nice, France, he took a fancy to chocolate. And in Southern France, he was impressed with the oranges. Thomas Jefferson was influential on the changing tastes in American food. He had an adventurous palate and he loved intricate dishes also. He loved ragouts, gateaux, souffles, 
ices, sauces, and wine cookery. He ate lightly and enjoyed every bite. He loved olives, figs, mulberries, but his greatest field of expertise, you can guess, was wine. And his very favorite wine was Madeira. Jefferson probably was America's very first wine connoisseur. An Englishman then drank heavy sweet wines like port and sherry. And during the Revolutionary War, Thomas Jefferson's tastes began to change. His 220 square foot wine cellar in Monticello indicates both his love for wine and the value of his wine. The door was double locked. The door was two layers thick. The door was iron strapped and fortified. Jefferson imported more than 20,000 bottles of wine for his personal collection. That's amazing, 20,000 bottles. He only drank wine during dinner and then only three or four glasses. He believed that wine stimulated the conversation and he loved talking about wine. Jefferson became enchanted with wine, of course, during his four years in Paris. And he drank Bordeaux, Champagne, Rhine and Moselle Riesling, and Tuscan Reds. His taste in wine was expensive. He did teach that wine was an alternative to whiskey and cider. And during his very first term as president, he spent $7,500 just on the wine. And this is equivalent today to $120,000. He only ordered wine from the finest of the French vineyards in bottles. He would not take the wine if it came from a cask, a wooden cask. This is how wine traveled then on the hot, dry ships. Jefferson knew that the middlemen watered the wine, so he wasn't about to have inferior wine. Ordering bottles of wine then was very unusual. And in 19... 85 in a wall in Paris, a hand blown green glass bottle of wine was found. And it was one of the world's greatest rarities. It was in perfect condition, was excellent color, and the wine was one half inch from the cork. Christie sold this bottle of wine in London and etched on the glass was 1787, the word Lafitte and the letters TH dot J dot. This small bottle of wine sold for $157,500 and it was bought by Christopher Forbes to add to the Forbes collection of presidential relics. And when asked if they would drink it, they said not in their lifetimes. Jefferson believed that our American land had the necessary soil and climate of the best wine countries. He knew wine in the United States would be as good as European wine. But of course, Thomas Jefferson was 150 years ahead of his time, but he continually imported grapevines from France. They arrived dead or almost dead, but he kept planting them and trying. The hot ocean transport was just 
not favorable to the grapevines. It was catastrophe after catastrophe on the grapevines. He just did not have the pesticides and our native insects loved the French grapevines. Jefferson kept hunting for native grapevines and he did make a scuppernog table wine, but it was never worthy. And today, one mile from Thomas Jefferson's home is a successful vineyard. Throughout his life, he wrote and spoke about the subject of agriculture, labor, farming, viticulture, and crops. And there could never be an ending for President Thomas Jefferson. So we will let his words live in our hearts with these four quotes. Agriculture is our wisest pursuit because it will in the end contribute most to real wealth, good morals, and happiness. I am never satiated with rambling through the fields and farms, examining the culture and cultivators with a degree of curiosity, which makes some take me to be a fool and others to be much wiser than I am. And that was a letter that he wrote to Lafayette in Nice, France, April 11th, 1787. I am become more firmly fixed to the glebe, to the lands and fields. And if you visit me as a farmer, it will be as a condisciple, a schoolfellow. For I am but a learner, an eager one indeed, but yet desperate, being too old now to learn a new art. However, I am as much delighted and occupied with it as if I was the greatest adept. And the fourth quote. Cultivators, farmers of the earth are the most valuable citizens. They are the most vigorous, the most independent, the most virtuous, and they are tied to their country and wedded to its liberty and interests by the most lasting bands. And these words say it all. And I enjoyed researching for this presentation. It was a true joy. And of course, I couldn't use all that I found. So there were some discards. And I'm going to share this tidbit that I know you will enjoy. And this happened in 1916. And the lucky city was Memphis, Tennessee. And the man who had this idea was Clarence Saunders. And this idea made the lives of every American better. You could do your own shopping. This was America's very first supermarket. You had your own shopping baskets. Each item had a price tag on it so you could figure how much the bill was going to be. And each employee had a uniform. This was a first. So if you needed help, it was easy to find an employee. And this was a franchise model. So these supermarkets spread. And best of all, the prices dropped. I think the reason this caught my attention was the name of this supermarket, which I'm sure you've already guessed, was Piggly Wiggly. Wiggly. And Clarence Saunders was asked all the time, why on earth did you name your supermarket Piggly Wiggly? And his answer, so you would ask. And don't you know Thomas Jefferson would have loved being in this supermarket. It would have been a true adventure. And thank you, thank you for being here. I love these Zooms. It's fun being together for sharing 
And this is a special day, April 13th. And Thomas Jefferson, a special, special American farmer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Davina Verna. Amazing. That was marvelous. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Um, I'm Brittany Kane. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is my fifth great grandfather. I just I descend from his daughter Martha through her oldest son Thomas Jefferson Randolph, and his daughter Jane Nicholas Randolph married Robert Garlic Hill Kane. Garlic's grandfather, Dr. Andrew Kane, was Jefferson's personal physician during his later years. Garlic and Jane are my great great grandparents. I will be at Monticello next week for the Monticello next month for the Monticello Association meeting as I am the treasurer for that association. Oh, good, good. But the 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 association is not actually associated with Monticello. The descendants of Martha and Maria, who make up the Monticello Association, own the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you for telling us that. Loved it. Thank you. Cannot hear you, Genesu. When you came in, you came in as a supplement and not as your main one. And I'm going to ask you why. I did Thomas, well, because I have done Thomas Jefferson to several societies and I wanted to do Thomas Jefferson Randolph to one. Yes, and so yes. I used him as my primary ancestor. Well, they're all honored farmers. It doesn't matter whether they're number one or two or three or four. <laughs> so, very True. good. True. Any other questions for Davina or statements? Uh, Davina, as always, you are phenomenal. Uh, Davina, would you please introduce uh, the uh, gentleman behind you? Oh, look. Look. Can you see him? No. Yes. No. There. There, there. He is. Look at this is an antique weather vane. Look at him. He's perfect. And he's red. <laughs> he he arrived like today. Yes, he's beautiful. Uh, from Tennessee. He's a Tennessee, a Tennessee weather being. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for spending uh, the time with us. Uh, Let me for... do the count. Oh, oh I've... Davina, would yes. you please share the count with yes. us? Yes, yes. 1,268 members, 1,322 honored American farmer supplementals. Wow, wow, wow. Thank could you. I, could I ask the, the number of the supplements again? The number 1,322. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. It's a good. It's a wonderful. Jen, I have to get my incentive into you. <laughs> and, and Rosalind, uh, one of our national officers is here also. Rosalind, would you like to bring greetings? I just saw your name come up. Oh, absolutely. What a fantastic um, presentation, Davina. We loved it. And it's so wonderful to have these um, informational Zoom meetings to educate us all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. With that, if there are no other comments, I'm going to turn it over to a uh, director, Toastmaster, a uh, director, director. Dennis <laughs> Sue, before you do that, there was one last slide. Oh, that's right. I apologize. Let me, let me get it back on. My apologies. Share screen. Go to here. Let's see. Okay. Let's say I can get it done. Sixteen should be it. There you go. This is. Oh no. This is like sixteen. This is there. a pin that we currently have available, and it's on the website, and it's a George Washington pin. It is absolutely beautiful, just gorgeous. So it says, I'd rather be on my farm 
than emperor of the world, George Washington. So if you uh, would like to have one, please order it from our website. It's on our shop right now. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. And I appreciate all of you for being here tonight. Glenn, I'm turning it over to you, sir. Thank you so much. You're That's welcome. wonderful. Um, Davina does great presentations. Mm -hmm. It was fun. It was fun, fun. Okay. Okay. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, asked you to indulge my garrulousness. Um, I couldn't really decide when to stop writing on this. So uh, <laughs> when I sat down to compose a toast to Thomas Jefferson, I quickly became aware that attempting to pay homage to his accomplishments in any suitable fashion would require far more time than any of us have this afternoon or even this month. Yes. Any praise I might give would be the faintest echo in comparison to the tomes that have already been written. That said, I thought the best approach to memorializing his service to our nation would be to look at our society through his eyes using his words. In addition to the many other pursuits of this true Renaissance man, Jefferson loved agriculture, as we've seen. On August 20th, 1811, he wrote in a letter to Charles Wilson Peale the following, no occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth and no culture comparable to that of the garden. Were he to see our society today, a gathering of women and men, all ages, all races and creeds, many of us even farmers ourselves, assembled for the purpose of commemorating the hard work of our farmer ancestors, I believe he would be overjoyed. Farming as a profession is as thankless as it is indispensable, and Jefferson would surely approve of an organization focused on giving farmers their due honors. Of course, the other function of our society is scholarships, and above all else, Jefferson prized knowledge in any form. He wrote to Francois Adrien van der Kemp on July 9th, 1820, the general mind must be strengthened by education. And to Uriah Forrest much earlier on New Year's Eve, 1787, educate and inform the whole mass of the people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. In just a few short years, our young societies provided tens of thousands of dollars in scholarships to the next generation of agricultural experts to ensure the country envisioned and indeed created by Jefferson continues to be strong and independent. Naturally, these scholarships would not be possible without the tremendous support of the members of our society. And Jefferson would deduce the main catalyst for such magnanimity to be the innate generosity within each of us. On October 14th, 1816, he wrote to his one-time rival and eventual close friend, John Adams, I believe that every human mind feels pleasure in doing good to another. The work of our society lends irrefutable credence to his statement. And so, to my fellow members of the National Society, descendants of American farmers, my friends, and indeed my family, I propose, I propose a toast to the memory of and in the spirit of Thomas Jefferson, founding father, president, scholar, and farmer. I wish each of you life, 